We are really excited um, for our keynote speaker today, and I want to say a special thank you to Mars Ice Cream for putting this together for us. And I would like to call up Bill Frazier with Mars to introduce our speaker, Jack Sinclair. All right, thanks, Michelle. Good morning. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Bill Fraser, and I run the U.S. sales team for Mars Ice Cream. And I joined the ice cream segment about a year ago, and prior to that, I spent around 15 years selling the Mars candy brand. So this was kind of all new to me coming over to the, the ice cream industry. And last year was my first opportunity to attend this convention. And I was really impressed with the quality of the event, and the passion of the attendees. And I gotta tell you, you guys can be brutally honest, which I appreciate, and you guys told us some things that we needed to work on. And one thing that, that Mars Ice Cream heard loud and clear from many of you was that Mars needed to have a lot louder voice and add more value within the industry and with the IA, IAI CDV. Um, last year, we were noticeably, notably absent from any sponsorships, right? And many of you told us that we could do a better job uh, providing distributors and retailers with better insights, uh, better innovation, and best practices so that you can help grow your entire business. So in the past 12 months, we've been busy, right? So we've made a number of, we've, uh, made a number of strides to help our distributors and our retailers grow the category. We've added resources in areas like category management, operations, account management, and we're currently upgrading a lot of our systems that all of you or many of you told us were really um, pretty cumbersome and difficult to work with. We're also going to be launching some, um, some new shopper insights in 2018 that will help all of you grow your category as well. Now specifically about with adding value to this convention, Mars Ice Cream is really excited to be a, to be a gold sponsor this year. And we're really excited to be able to bring you our keynote speaker, Mr. Jack Sinclair, who I'm going to bring up to the stage in just a few moments. Um, I, had an, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Jack at dinner last night, and I know all of you are going to get a ton of value from hearing about his industry insights, his stories, and his thoughts about succeeding in today's highly competitive and rapidly evolving marketplace. As many of you know, Jack is currently the chief merchandising officer at 99 cent only stores. He's also an experienced and successful retailer who's worked in senior leadership, senior leadership positions both here in the US and in the UK. Now before his role at 99 cent only stores, Jack was the executive vice president of the Walmart grocery business and under his leadership, they were able to drive strong growth in Walmart's grocery share. Now prior to his experience in the US, Jack spent over 20 years working for many of the best known grocery retailers in the UK, including Fine Fair, Tesco, and Safeway, where he served on the board of directors while acting as their managing director. During much of his career, Jack's been a passionate advocate for healthy eating and sustainability initiatives. He's worked with the leading food manufacturers, large technology companies, academics, and numerous agencies to initiate positive change across the food industry. On behalf of Mars Ice Cream, please join me in welcoming to the stage a true retailing trailblazer and respected leader, Mr. Jack Sinclair. Thank you. Perfect. Put this down somewhere. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks very much. I think he oversold me, to be honest with you. But uh, so, thank you for inviting me to speak to you all. It's a it's a real privilege to speak at the 48th convention of such a prestigious organisation. Um, I didn't know much about the International Association of Ice Cream Distributors and Vendors. It's a long name, and maybe you want to think about just making it a little bit more catchy going forward. But um, <laughs> I, I'm delighted to be here. The publicity material for this convention promises an ice cream social surrounded by ice cream aficionados. And I thought to myself, who on earth could turn down such an invitation? You all represent a product that really does bring joy 
to so many people across the world. Across the world, we've all got happy memories of having ice cream with our families and friends when, we're, when we were infants. We don't forget those experiences. We recall those brands from our infancy. For me, in the 1960s in Scotland, I was given a real treat when my family took us to Equi's Ice Cream Parlour in Hamilton in the west of Scotland. Many of you have similar experiences of ice cream from your brands that you experienced in your childhood. Every community, every state, every country has magical names from your industry. Your Hall of Fame inductees are peppered with individuals who took those small local brands and turned them into something bigger. Whether it be Sid and Errol Barish, who turned the Dickie D brand from an eight-bike distribution route in Winnipeg, Canada, to a nationwide brand sold in retailers and across distribution routes across Canada. From eight bikes in 1959 to a Unilever acquisition in 1992, that's amazing. In 1956, Bill and Jim Conway started Mr. Softy in West Philadelphia. Mr. Softy is now an iconic name in ice cream and is available in many states across the nation and is indeed even available now in China. And what about Jay Swartz, whose father Max started the Jack and Jill Ice Cream Company in Philadelphia in 1929? Their website starts with the phrase, making memories since 1929. That catchphrase best captures the magic of ice cream. That is what ice cream does. It makes memories. That's what you all do. You make memories. And it's a pleasure to be here, it really is. So the young lady in the picture there kind of captures what I mean by making memories. She's the daughter of our financial controller in uh, 99 cent stores. And um, she's got a large tub of Breyer's ice cream, which she'd purchased at the 99 cent store on Wiltshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. It kind of captures the magic memories that I've been talking about. So just quickly, I'm going to talk about the agenda that I'm going to talk about this morning. After we get done with all this, you can all get back to your ice cream social and make some more ice cream memories. I'm surrounded by so many ice cream aficionados, I'm certainly not qualified to add very much to your understanding about ice cream or your industry. I'm planning to share some experiences from my background in food and grocery retailing over 45 years in different countries, living and working in different countries. I've also worked in two different US states in the 10 years that I've been here. Quite honestly, working in Arkansas and California feels like working in different countries rather than different states. But that's probably a discussion for another ice cream social at a later date. I'm currently based in Los Angeles working in value retailing at 99 cent stores. I've seen a lot of changes in markets over 45 years and the best part of being a retailer is to see those changes coming alive in store. It's in fa fantastic to experience firsthand the new products and new ideas hitting the shelves and seeing how customers buy into those ideas. Innovation is not easy. It takes bravery, it involves risk taking, and not every idea is a good one. But without innovation, mar markets stagnate and companies fail. I'm going to go through some innovation that I've experienced in the ice cream industry. I'll then go through some very specific changes that have changed other markets dramatically in recent years. Much of the great innovations that I've witnessed over the years has been fueled by technology and or great entrepreneurs. It's clear that retailing, manufacturing, distribution is all being transformed by disruptive technology. I'm then going to comment on the fact that technology, technological advances in the food industry and in food production is unfortunately viewed with suspicion by millennial consumers rather than embraced. I've got somewhat against the grain views on GMOs and antibiotics in animal production. These are issues which are important to the ice cream industry and important to the food industry in total. I am genuinely concerned about the wider impact of a society, about the wider impact of a society that mistrusts its food industry. And there's some evidence that millennials do indeed mistrust the food industry. 
Finally, I'm going to give you a perspective on the seismic changes going on in retailing as we experience them today. That's my next slide, and it highlights the I've had, a, I've had a variety of merchandising, marketing, and operation roles at the following retailers since 1983. My first real job was at a company called Shoppers Paradise, a limited discount assortment discount retailer in the UK based in Hertfordshire, England, which was part of the Fine Fair Group, which was a sister company of Loblaws that many of you from Canada will be very familiar with. One of my first assignments was to be part of a small team that was trying to centralise frozen food distribution from a direct store model to a centralised model. I think this is a common issue for many in this room that I've wrestled with over many years. Many retail executives in their drive for distribution efficiency has allowed the quality of ice cream to be compromised at the point of sale. I learned that lesson in the 1980s at Shoppers Paradise. You as an industry need to keep reminding us of that today. Efforts to centralise frozen foods often misunderstand the different challenges of distributing ice cream as opposed to frozen food. If ice cream is distributed at the wrong temperature, and you don't have me to tell you this, quality is compromised. And too often in too many places, that is exactly what happens. Our solution for our 450 stores at Shoppers Paradise was to retain DSD for ice cream. That led us to persuade brands to carry their competitors' brands alongside their own brands on their own trucks, which as you know, sometimes leads to harmony and sometimes leads to complication, confusion, and compromise. The best solution is for independent distributors to be neutral on brands, very good at service, very efficient on cost, but neutral on brands. The challenge and dilemma between the choice of distributors, whether for a retailer, whether to use a distributor, to use DSD, or self-distribution, exists as much today as it did back in those days. My experience at the Fine Fair Group also gave me a front row seat watching at the evolution of private label at grocers around the world. In a quest to increase margins and create differentiation, retailers began to challenge the dominance of brands in many core markets. Firstly, with inferior quality alternatives. Loblaws in Canada and Fine Fair in the UK had an opening price point generic label called Yellow Pack, which was cheap and poor quality. Then Loblaws launched President's Choice, which was exactly the opposite. A real brand at a better quality than the brands. Today's President's Choice is one of the major and top brands in Canada. Chocolate chip cookies is seen as one of the best ch chocolate chip cookies in the world. Their ice cream is outstanding. And President Choice has spawned a whole host of replication across the world. From M&S and Sainsbury's in the UK to Migros in Switzerland. And probably was the origin of the Kirkland brand, which is such a phenomenal success at Costco. This development continues to this day with powerful product development ex expertise at Trader Joe's and Whole Foods. Aldi and Lidl have got outstanding premium private label development. The challenge for many branded companies in, fa in fast-moving consumer goods is to keep innovating, to stay ahead of the very pervasive growth of premium private label. Private label development in ice cream has created many fantastic products around the world. When I joined Tesco, the UK's fourth largest retailer in the early 1990s, they were embracing the trends of centralised distribution and private label that I was talking about, as well as significantly improving the quality of their fresh foods in their quest for market share growth. My role in Fresh at Tesco began to teach me about the role of farmers, the importance of suppliers and vendors, in the need, and the need for retailers to have a thriving supply chain to ensure consistency of volume and quality for their customers. One of the reasons that Tesco caught up and overtook Jay Sainsbury's as the number one retailer in the UK was their appreciation for the importance of a healthy supply chain and healthy vendors. Tesco's UK success gave them both the money and the confidence, and perhaps the overconfidence, to launch fresh and easy in the UK. And although ultimately ill-fated, 
the joint venture arrangements at Frit, the joint venture arrangements that they set up with a number of vendors in the US was, I believe, a good thing for retailers to copy and mirror in the US. I joined Safeway in the early 1990s. The biz business had been purchased from, K by, from KKR by the Argyle Group. The Safeway UK stores were at that time controlled from California prior to the KKR purchase. Argyle purchased Safeway from KKR for $1 billion. One day after KKR completed a $5 billion purchase of Safeway using only $150 million of cash. Astonishing deal which really was a precursor for a lot of the private equity deals in retail. It was my first experience of how well private equity firms can understand values in business and extract value quickly. The leverage buys of cash generative retailers has accelerated dramatically because of the success of that deal. Some of these deals have been successful, some of them have not. And the scale of of, of leveraged buys in retail is actually a cause for another debate and perhaps another ice cream social at another date. Safeway UK emerged as a public company and we were able to build on the strengths from Safeway in California. Safeway had a great strength in fresh foods, great strength in bakery, great strength in private label. We built on those strengths in developing new formats and again another trend that came from from the Safeway business. We built small convenience stores as well as super centers. Our super centers were loosely modeled on the, Wal the astonishing success of the Walmart business, which we admired from a distance. Astonishing growth in, in their food business through super centers across the US. When it comes to convenience stores, many of the initiatives we had were centered on food to go, quick service restaurants, and the opportunities in what I would describe as the catering space. I'm a huge admirer of what Wegmans do in the US, huge admirer of what Whole Foods do in this market. And some of the large Japanese retailers do an outstanding job at creating a food culture within a grocery environment. I do, do believe there's real opportunities for ice cream brands to really muscle in on this space. I'm always astonished when we do research on Rite Aid at the strength of their thrifty ice cream business and how much traffic's driven by having thrifty ice cream in a right, it's a kind of incongruous thing, but a pharmacy operation, a chemist operation that has sells, has got such a strong, strong strength in its, in its thrifty brand. I don't think ice, I think ice cream operators could do a lot more at getting in around the grocery traffic that exists. At Safeway, we were the first UK retailer to introduce a loyalty card and embarked on mining that data to gain insights on the customer. It's amazing how that world has been transformed in the past 20 years. Big data is changing the way we look at customers and the way we analyze customers. I see what data we have today at 99 without loyalty cards. We're using mobile technology, tracking technology to understand our customers better and better. And it's actually making loyalty card data obsolete. The world of you mining the data of the customers you've got has moved on to mining the data of the customers that you haven't got to understand how to drive traffic to retail. It really is astonishing how mobile technology and data is changing the way retailers are analyzing their data. And I think there's a huge opportunity in the worlds that you guys live in, which is working with consumers in such a broad space of places and understanding how they're moving around through mobile is a, is a world that's opening up dramatically in the last little while. So I was then presented with the opportunity to join Walmart in the US in 2007 and moved to a place called Arkansas. I, uh, I told my wife we, we might be moving to the US and she said, oh great, New York, Chicago. And I said, no, no, it's Arkansas. And her response was, where's that? Um, and I wouldn't say that now being a proud Razorback. But for a food guy who'd watched the astonishing growth of the Walmart food business since the early 90s, from zero to over $100 billion, it was an offer that I really couldn't turn down. Sam Walton had sadly long since passed away when I joined Walmart. 
But what Sam Walton did, from one little store in a corner of northwest Arkansas to a, a half a trillion dollar enterprise across the world, it's remarkable. A great entrepreneur who used technology to create distribution muscle, had a great customer instinct, combined with an appreciation for data. He created a culture, a culture of never being satisfied with anything, no matter how good it was. A culture which that strive to get better, strive for excellence, bordered on paranoia. And amazingly, long after Sam Walton passed away, the culture in the business really hasn't changed at all over those years. And this relentless focus on the customer and satisfying the customer was a very, pre very big part of being part of the world at Walmart. And a focus on both the short term and the long term. One minute we'd be talking about sales in the past hour. Literally we'd get hourly sales and we'd look at those hourly sales and pay attention to what's happening in the last hour. To then next minute talking about what the opportunities are to build, to, the, the, to build stores in Lagos, Nigeria. And where's Africa going to be in 20, 30 years' time? Where's the internet going to be in 30 years' time? This short, long-term focus going in parallel is something that many businesses struggle to wrestle with. So they've been working really hard to um, improve their food business over the course of the last 20 years. And you should expect them to continue to develop that, that business. The biggest challenge for me working at Walmart was always to manage its scale. Changing things took too long. It's very difficult when you're controlling 20, 30% of the US marketplace to make changes. And make changes to improve for the customer had significant implications for vendors and communities. And Walmart were very concerned to make sure those things were managed appropriately. But it takes a long time to make things change. A super tanker like Walmart is hard to change and it's one of the challenges that they, they have. The other thing that for a food retailer, very interesting working at Walmart, was I managed to visit 48 states across the... Oh, a little bird flying around here, it's nice. Um, I managed to visit 48 of the 50 states when I worked at Walmart and I promise you Minnesota and Louisiana are very different places. It's amazing that it kind of amazing that Walmart works. It's kind of amazing that it hangs together, how it all works. But the challenge of trying to put the right brands and the right products in the right place when you're trying to be efficient and effective at being your distribution efficiencies are right and your merchandising efficiencies are right. The challenge of doing that really required a lot of discipline and a lot of effort to get the right product in the right place. Ice cream's a really good example of that. Getting the right ice cream in the right region of the country, you guys understand this much better than me, is a real challenge and getting that right was one of the one of the great, I think we made some progress on that and having 50 distribution centers across the nation did help in enable to get that done right. But even understanding the customer was pretty interesting because it's not just a geography thing, it's a demographic thing as well. I always remember going into a store in Nashville, Tennessee, and we're doing pretty well in Nashville, and we went into one of these stores, and um, the, cut, the store manager said, we've got it all wrong in our fresh assortment, because there's a big Bosnian Muslim population in this one, who would have known, in one region, one part of one part of Tennessee in Nashville, in one part of Nashville, this one store had a big population, so we thought, well, how are we going to do that, and we had a big, in, in Michigan, we had a fairly extensive um, product assortment that was appropriate for the Muslim population. So we put that into Nashville. We said, okay, we'll figure it out and bring it down. It was a disaster because the Bosnian Muslim population is totally different to the Muslim population in, in Michigan. So we got it all wrong. So trying to do the right things, we got things wrong a lot. And that's, I'm just trying to kind of get to you the challenge of working in the, U, as the US as a nationwide business, especially in food where there's a lot of very specific things need done. The more ice, ice cream can play a key role in helping Walmart get better at this and they did do some work on that. So there is really so much, I learned so much from working at Walmart and I think there is a lot to learn from Walmart and if you haven't read Sam Walton's book Made in America, it's well worth a read. It's not, it's not a difficult read but it's well worth a read and really um, I don't think it could have happened anywhere else than America. And a lot of the stories I'm going to talk to you about now are about innovation and development that really could only happen in America. So moving on, I then um, came to another great American. I came to join 99. 
And that guy on the left there is a guy called Dave Gold, who started 99 cent stores in uh, 1992. He's sadly, again, he's passed away as well. Another great American business story. When I arrived at 99, the book that, Sam, that Dave Gold had passed around the office in in the city of Commerce, California, and was everyone on everyone's desk, was made in America from Sam Walton. And this, this, this idea of entrepreneurs that grow businesses, which is so prevalent in your industry, was very, very clear within the, the Dave Gold story at 99 cents. A wholesale business based, he started, his first, he started off working as a, wholesale, in a, as a wholesaler in the building in downtown Los Angeles that is now Grand Central Market and has now become a food hub for the nation. And if you go around, if you ever get a chance to go to LA, have a walk around Grand Central Market. They've got amazing food experiences which are being celebrated, as I say, across the nation. But that's where Dave started in a very different environment many years ago. They've got a McConnell's ice cream in there, which I'm making some magic memories with that as well in there. Um, Dave's vision started with experimenting between 98 and a dollar. And what he found was that when he sold something at 99 cents, it sold better than whether it was 98 cents or a dollar. So he built his business on 99 cents. And that whole concept of 99 cents was what's fueled the business. We as a management team now have kind of embraced the 99 and start selling things at one. We only sell things with a 99 ending now. 199, 299, 999, 899. As long as it's extreme value, it works. But this 99 is a magic number in people's minds. And Dave discovered that and built a business of two, over $2 billion, 400 stores across four states on the back of that kind of simple idea. Out of pretty humble beginnings, He's turned a really big business, and again, I think it's only in America that can happen. A business that he sold to Aries Capital for one and a half billion dollars a few years later after he built it. So that's pretty impressive in terms of being able to do that. And the nice thing about working at, nine, at 99, and I assure you this, and it totally surprised me. I had really hadn't heard of 99. But the loyalty of the customers that do come to 99 is like nothing I've experienced in retail. When I worked at Walmart, you had a lot of customers would kind of come and ask, well, why are you doing this and why? A lot of kind of complaints every so often. I can't, we do a lot of research. I can't find one customer that doesn't like it. That's really unusual. And there's a passion and a loyalty around it. And it's part of the heritage of LA that we hope to build into a lot of other places going forward. This picture here which you probably want, it doesn't actually come out very well here. That was taken by a German photographer called Andreas Gersky in the same store that that little girl bought the ice cream. Exactly the same store. That picture is now in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It's, um, this is what an art critic said about it. Shot from an elevated perspective and produced on an epic scale, Gersky captures the modern world. Not sure about that, but this picture sold is the most expensive picture ever sold. Now, you don't believe me, do you? Because I didn't believe it. $2.3 million, that picture. It really doesn't do it justice. On the right, sold for. Time magazine a month ago brought out the 100 most important pictures ever. So alongside Muhammad Ali and Tiananmen Square and the landing on the moon and Nelson Mandela, that picture's on page 83, capturing the modern world. So that's kind of neat that we've got, and it's the only retail picture in the book. So it's sold for $2.3 million, the most expensive photograph ever sold, and it adorns our offices in the city of commerce all round. And it's something that um, has actually fueled our, what we're trying to do at the moment in 99. What it allows you to do, what you see in that picture, if you could see it better, is you can see all around the store. And it's prompted us to redo all our stores exactly like that. So that new store there that we've opened in Montebello is based on the Gursky, Gursky picture, where we take all the fixtures down and you can see all around the store. Because what we sell, which again surprised me, is a broad assortment of goods. Most discount retailers have a limited assortment, Aldi, Lidl, or some of the dollar guys. They tend to send a limited assortment. We're very broad assortment. We sell as much as a Walmart in a 15,000 square foot store, and the traffic's much bigger than that. So re-emphasizing that in our new stores has been part of it. And it's also something that we've been re-emphasizing in our advertising. 
So what we've tried to do is capture this idea that you can get the full assortment at 99 and you can solve the problems of your family. If you're having a party, those little pick, every single thing that's on these pictures is sold in the 99 store. So that whole change has come about over the last little while and we're seeing really significant sales growth at the moment. We think we're the fastest growing retail in the nation at the moment on the back of these initiatives that's driving more and more traffic to the store, which is unusual in retail at the moment. Um, that's the kind of campaign that we're putting together and we're the other point I want to talk about is how different advertising is and how media is changing. Two years ago, 100% of our spend was in newspaper press ads. Today, it's zero. We're using mobile. We're communicating through mobile. We're communicating directly. These are bus stop things. We're on the radio. We're on... It's not TV anymore. It is making live shots. It's making live commercials, but it's shooting them through mobile data, shooting them through mobile technology and sh shooting them through the internet that's driving a lot of our spend. So we're spending the same amount of money, but we're spending it totally differently. And that's based on understanding data even more. Segmentation of customers, understanding data even more. So more and more retailers are going to use data. And I, I would, I, I'm sure all of you are in the middle of wrestling with how to use the vast expanse of data that can come at you to do things even better going forward. Um, so that kind of captures what we're trying to do at 99. And then I'm going to do a little bit of a commercial for ice cream for a moment at 99, if I may. Um, this is the 99 cent store at the moment. We've, got, we've invested in some cabinets to get some nice looking ice cream in the, in the cabinets. And we've also got some front end impulse product under Blue Bunny. But quite frankly, we're not selling as much ice cream as we'd like to. Of all the categories that, we're, that are growing in our business, ice cream's the one that's growing the slowest. We've invested in the correct temperatures in cabinets in our new stores. We've got some DSD, which does pretty well for us at the front of our stores. But our, our regular business, that, our regular business isn't where it needs to be. Um, we don't have a good enough assortment of brands. We don't uh, distribute ice cream well from our central distribution. And we need a solution. I've been in the place I was, I'm actually back in the place I was in in 1983 in Chopper's Paradise, which is, I don't know what to do about ice cream. Quite interesting, really. The world never changes. You go around in circles. And um, our self-distribution is actually too wrapped up in our frozen food business. And as a result, we're not building a regular value assortment for our customers. Ice cream is one of the few categories we're not seeing significant growth in 2017. We're looking for some help. And there's a significant opportunity for someone out there. So that's a kind of little bit of an invitation. If you want to sell some more ice cream, come and talk to me. I'm assuming you all do. Um, innovation in ice cream. I've had a lot of fun with ice cream over the years, having worked in it for all, these, all this time. And I want to talk to you more about this broader ice cream business now. One way or another, I've been set trying to sell ice cream over most of my time in the food industry. And the most satisfying thing has definitely been seeing new products hitting the marketplace. I've picked out a few from my time that have been particularly interesting to me. No particular reason, no particular order, and no, no one's better than the other. Other than that, I think they demonstrate that when your categories invest and support innovation, the customer responds well. Don't let your industry go the way of many others in the food space in the last two, three years. Where an obsession with cutting costs has hit both the R&D, the R&D spends have been reduced, marketing spends have been reduced, and that's led to stagnating growth across the grocery space. And that's created a lack of interest in a lot of grocery categories, and actually has affected the efficacy of a lot of grocery stores across the United States. Lack of innovation, lack of R&D, lack of marketing, people get bored with brands and it actually leads to stagnating growth. Vianetta on the top left hand corner here, does everyone know what Vianetta is? So Vianetta is like, I can't believe how insanely excited I was when Vianetta launched in the 80s in the United Kingdom. Um, it's a multi-layered ice cream thing with chocolate going through the middle of it. It's pretty clever. Um, these layers of chocolate. And I had the opportunity as a really young buyer, I visited the 
Bird, it was bird's eye walls in those days. I think it's Unilever. Yeah, it's Unilever bought bird's eye walls in those days in Gloucester in the west of England. And they had built a new factory just to make this thing. And they, when I went to watch it, it's mesmerizing the technology as to how this stuff is made. The ice cream coming out, the chocolate coming out, fast, 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 and then cutting it up and going into Amazing to watch, really amazing to watch. It's actually when I was doing a little work on this thing, I went on YouTube. It's on YouTube if you want to see it. It's really cool. So take the opportunity to watch ice cream being made from a long, long time ago. What it shows is technology and innovation. It created a huge, I think it's still a huge product in the UK. It was a huge product for us in the 80s and 90s, one of the top selling ice cream products. I've got no idea who invented Vionetta, but he, he or she must have been a really clever guy. Really clever guy. And to the investment in technology to create new products. Vionetta was my first real example of what can happen if something new comes to the marketplace. And it was kind of really neat to watch it. I, I, why is it not more widely available in the US? It's all over the place, but the US, I don't, maybe somebody can explain that to me. When, We'll sell it for 99 cents if anyone wants to sell it to us. <laughs> um, the launch of Hagen Das and Ben and Jerry's was the first time people started to come and talk to me about butterfat levels, inclusions, the technology of making things better quality and putting, thing, putting inclusions in the middle of it. And again, in the UK, when these were launched, these were big, big deals when they came and launched, us in the U launched to us in the U.S. Ice cream used to just be pretty basic in supermarkets in the UK. And um, th this new product, new taste, new quality started to bring into supermarket those experiences that I had at Peter Equis. And you start getting into the idea of at home getting the same kind of experiences from ice cream that you would get in the, you would get a, 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 at a, a parlor. So they also raised a lot of fundamental issues that I've talked about, about temperature. These guys from haagen wouldn't sell us at Safeway because they said, you're not good, your temperature's not right. They were really kind of, we're not going to sell it to you because you can't handle it properly. They were quite strict about it. I think they've lost a little bit of that strictness and probably compromised their quality perspective, quality issues because of that. But in, and it forced us to get better at what we do. So haagen was a really good example of somebody saying, we're not going to compromise our quality by letting the temperature go at the wrong, to let things go at the wrong temperature. And we, we, we loved that product, did very well for us. And Ben and Jerry's was just insane when they came to see us. I've got, a, you, got you guys will all know these guys, I don't, but when they first came in to launch in the UK, I'm not joking, these two guys, Ben and Jerry, came in dressed in Native American head, full Native American head to toe headgear. And they come in chanting, like a Native American chant, all the way through the executive offices. And like in those days in the 80s, very stern kind of big carpets and brown kind of like desks. These guys coming in, it was insane the impact they made culturally on our office bringing that in. And they brought a lot of fun to ice cream and think about what they did over the years to kind of stimulate that fun. Again, we launched it, it did very, very well for us. And kind of these flavors and inclusions and what they did to make ice cream better was a real, real revelation in the UK at the time. And we had a lot of fun with that one as well. Um, so, and this, this Talenti thing, which is a more modern thing, that, when that came into Walmart, that did really, really well. That, that whole concept of getting kind of slightly lower fat and giving the same texture, same flavor and same texture, that's done really, really well. It's interesting how these old guys always get bought up by somebody big, which is part of the magic of kind of, kind of the magic of commerce and the magic of capitalism. But great, great examples of things that changed marketplaces. So, um, mm, so then, the next thing that happened was from butterfat and inclusions, people started talking about enrobing technology, how to put chocolate around product. And I think that was the start of this brand, this tr trend toward candy brands or confectionery brands where I was at the time, coming into ice cream. And the technology of making ice cream with really good quality chocolate around it rather than some of the more compromised chocolates that had come before was a really big deal. 
And that's what allowed us to start seeing. The first product I was exposed to was Mars ice cream. Mars chocolate bars in the UK. I don't, again, I don't understand why you guys don't bring them into the US, but Mars chocolate bars in the UK is a huge thing. People eat them and love them. So they brought out a Mars ice cream bar. It was made in a factory in France, and I went to see the factory at Strasbourg in France. And this technology of putting chocolate around it and doing it so fast and putting it into little packets was insane. And it launched, it did really, really well. We were on allocation. We could, in fact, I've not quite forgiven Mars for putting me on allocation and not selling me all that we could sell on Mars ice cream bars in those early days. But it, it, And then it prompted Snickers, and then it prompted Twix, and Dove and Gal well, Galaxy there. So the whole world changed really fast around ice cream, around branded ice cream. And it's been pretty well established that that's working really well across the marketplace. I think it could be doing better in the US, if I'm honest. Still don't think you're putting enough behind it, if whoever's listening, putting enough behind it to drive that business forward. I think there's huge opportunities for that. And it was a, it was a fantastic experience. For customers loved this stuff when it came out. There's a magic about candy bars. And if you link that to ice cream, it makes a huge, huge impact. Um, going forward, let's look at some other ideas. This thing here, dairy milk is a huge thing in the UK, and that was launched. I was back in the UK not long ago, and these were the three things that I found that I thought were really interesting. Mars ice cream, uh, Car Cadbury's dairy milk, has got all these new types of inclusions in it, real fun things, and the, the kind of bringing other candies into the candy from the candy brand, making that come alive. And there's about 40, I found about 40 different dairy milk, tubs of ice cream, and all sorts of different things going on there. And Maltesers, does anyone know what Maltesers are? No, nobody, no, the Mars guys will know. But apart from that, Maltesers is another, it's like a really good Whopper. Whoppers in the US are not good. Maltesers are really good. These are these honeycomb metal chocolate balls that you can buy in the UK. They've launched it as an ice cream. And I don't know when you did it. It must have been really recent. But how they get these little honey... I tried it. It's, it's insanely good. Little honeycomb things in the middle of the ice cream. How they did it. I'd love somebody to show me how you do that. Because I like factories and stuff. But that is amazing. Really amazing. Product's great. I'm sure it's doing really, really well. Um, a Ribena is a very, very iconic and well-known drink. A dilutable drink. You pour it in, pour water on top of it, and it's a very well-known. And Nestle have got this product in the, US, in the UK, and I think it's doing really, really well. But it gives, again, the idea of how you bring brands, not just candy brands, but what other brands could be brought to ice cream to change the whole thing going around. Um, going down the bottom. Then it moved from, so we did... Um, butter fat, we did inclusions, we did enrobing, and then they started putting sticks in. How do you get stick enrobed? And that Magnum product in the middle down there has been a phenomenon like no other. You guys know this better than me. I think it's the world's number one brand of ice cream now. But putting a stick in an enrobed chocolate and creating the sort of products they've got, that was, an, for Walmart, that was an insane launch when we got that. Really huge when that came in and continues to be a very strong thing. Outshine bars. Those bars, again, getting more natural, getting natural fruit in it, making less artificial. So popsicles that are more natural. Mothers worry about their family more than they worry about themselves. All the data says that. So the idea of giving something that's healthier, even if it's not healthier, healthier in their mind is a big, big part of consumer trends at the moment. People need to be... It's sad in some ways because mothers are kind of getting misled in some ways but the print this is not that's not misleading the fruit content in that is really strong and I think it's a really good initiative how that's working and you see more and more of that stuff coming out and the Yazo frozen yogurt stuff that's come out I think that's really interesting as well kind of captures this idea of slightly lower fat content and allowing people to kind of get access to the product get access to the experience and not feel quite so guilty about it. And I know Target are selling a lot of this stuff. And again, it's a kind of great entrepreneur story when Amanda Klein and Drew Harrington started this up in 2010 or something like that. And they've turned that into a really significant business from virtually nowhere. A great, again, a great American story. And on the top right here, I've just put a couple of other things in here, because international brands, and the interesting thing, when you go to India, there's Vidalia ice cream brand, vegan, vegetarian ice cream, which is 
kind of a little bit weird as well. But the principle of it is big. And the product quality those guys have got out there is really, really good. And you're beginning to see that come into the US now much more, this idea of vegan ice cream and where it will go. And that one there is really just because I'm Scottish and I wanted, to put ma I wanted to put something from Scotland up there. That ice cream on the left there is Mackey's Scottish ice cream. The interesting thing, and I know the guy very well, Maitland Mackey, that started that company. It's a vertically integrated thing. He started with cows milking cows in Aberdeen, and he's turned it into the number one. And so this vertical integration, which again is kind of common in parts of ice cream. I love it when that vertical integration comes alive and people feel that it's related to the, the very, they'll relate the product to the, the base production of it. And Maitland's got a lovely business. It's the number one brand in Scotland, that one. Um, so that's a kind of personal view of the kind of things that have been happening and the, the, the issues for me like I've said all, all, all along here technology, innovation entrepreneurship, guts all of these things come alive in a lot of these different examples of what's happening in the ice cream industry and it's not just the ice cream industry you look at other industries you look at the yogurt industry, that has been transformed, that Chobani yogurt story is an amazing one a guy called Hamdi Ulakaya, I don't know if you guys know who he is, he came here he's he, grew, he learned to grow, eh, grow he learned to make yogurt from his grandmother on the Turkish Armenian mountains and he came to the US, didn't like the yogurt and said I'm going to make some good yogurt made this Greek yogurt in a factory that he bought for a dollar in upstate New York, he bought it for a dollar in upstate New York, the old Kraft Philadelphia factory. And within, it's the fastest growing business from not to a billion dollars in history. Any sector, any country. It's an amazing story. And it started with, I can make yogurt better than the yogurt I, I'm buying in the stores. And yogurt's not a big American thing. If you think about it, it's a big European thing. It's amazing how this trend has changed, the protein trend and how people have chased after yogurt like never before. And what he's done, He's now got a factory out in, in Idaho, he's got a factory in New York, and built this business from nowhere has been an amazing story. And it's based on product quality and believing in the product that he had. It's, he, he tells a story of him driving around Wisconsin trying to find second-hand dairy equipment because he had no money, and then adapting it to make the yogurt that he wanted to make. And... Um, He's another one that wouldn't sell to Walmart because he you know, it's kind of still I still bear a grudge with him as well. He wouldn't sell anything to Walmart. And that one at the bottom there is Nusa. I don't know if you know what that one is. Nusa yogurt is a, it's based on an Australian concept. There's a place in New South in Brisbane near in Queensland near Brisbane that makes there's a, it's called Nusa yogurt. You go and you line up. It's like an ice cream parlor. And the young girl that came over here, she was pretty young, Cole Tomai, she came over here pretty young to Colorado to ski. She didn't like, she thought the stuff that she buys at that place in Noosa, and she had no connection with it, would sell really, really well in the US. She went back to Australia, said to the guys, will you give me the license to sell it in the, U U the US, started the business. It's a really indulgent, if you taste it, it's amazing. Really, really good, a really indulgent yogurt. All over the place now. Started with that that idea and made it come alive and uh, I always get very inspired by people who can get off their backsides and do stuff like that and make things really come alive. So yogurt's been a transform. What about coffee? Who would have believed 20 years ago that 20, 20, nearly 20% 20 of the US population would have a Keurig machine? A Keurig machine, a machine where you just put a thing in and all of a sudden you've got a cup of coffee. It's insane that that would happen. It's transformed the market. That was invented by a guy called John Sylvian in the early 1990s. He had an idea. He thought he could change, change the world with it. All over the place you see Keurig machines. There's some real problems with Keurig machines. The quality of the coffee isn't that good. And as the coffee culture changes, people are becoming more demanding of that quality. It's very un environmentally unsustainable. I'm actually working with a, a group of smart entrepreneurs in Boston and a company called Bavrada that's going to try and fix this problem with a lot of really interesting stuff going on there. And that's the coffee culture has changed dramatically. Starbucks started it all off. Who would have believed we'd all spend five bucks for a cup of coffee a few years ago? It wasn't credible. But what's happened now is that um, Starbucks is almost out of date and it's third wave coffee that's coming along. Companies like La Colombe and, and um, Blue Bunny, those, those, rest, those coffee restaurants, coffee cafe, cafes are coming alive. And um, 
Lacolom is a business that uh, started by Hamdi. Hamdi's invested in it. Hamdi, the yogurt guy, has invested in this. That iced latte is the first canned iced latte in the marketplace. Launched about six months ago. I don't know if you've ever tasted it. It's unbelievable. They're building a factory in Michigan right now to make this stuff because the volumes are so insane. And the culture of coffee and how coffee is evolving, cold coffee, the blue, the blue, uh, the blue bottle um, coffee business sells more than 50%. They've got about 20 restaurants, 20 cafes. They sell more than 50% as, as, as cold coffees. Iced coffee is changing the coffee world so fast. And the technology behind how you make iced coffee and then what you do with it, there's a lot of really interesting trends that are fusing the interest in coffee with the third wave coffee. And it's become a fashion business as opposed to kind of like a coffee business. And it's amazing how that's changing. It's really interesting to watch. Other markets that have changed. Drinks. I don't think you could have believed that some guy in his Austrian kitchen making Red Bull could have turned Coca-Cola on its head. Red Bull, I don't know what it's worth now, billions and billions of dollars. And it's a phenomenon across the world in terms of, and they've, they've done a really nice job and lots of lessons, I think, for the in ice cream industry in it. Control your distribution and control your point of purchase and you've got absolute control over your brand. And they did that really, really well. At times in their evolution, they must have thought, how can we get in with the Coca-Cola routes? How can we get in with the, the Pepsi-Cola routes? Which is what's happened to a lot of the other guys. The Monster business, which was kind of like amazing growth as well. Energy drinks followed up from, from Red Bull. They're on the Coke trucks now, and that's a big big route to market challenge that they've kind of solved. And five hour energy is another thing. Who would have believed we'd all be, well, I'm not, but lots of people would be supping five hour energies before they go and play golf or whatever else they're doing with it. It's amazing how that's changed the energy space. Buy drinks, that was started up relatively recent ago. It's now been bought by Dr. Pepper. Really, antioxidant drink and Dr. Pepper doesn't feel like a combination that makes a lot of sense, but the world of soft drinks, the world of carbonated beverages is changing so fast. People are getting so nervous about the health disbenefits of standard carbonated soft drinks. And I think there is again an opportunity for ice cream to think about how to how does some of these trends in drinks apply in the same with the same consumer trends in the ice cream space. Um, and it's amazing to think Naked is now part of Pepsi. Buy is now part of Dr. Pepper. Honest Tea is now part of um, Coca-Cola. Vita Coke, coconut water's on fire, particularly in California. It's amazing how well that sounds. Vita Coconut is now sold by Coca-Cola. And that thing at the bottom there, La Croix, La Croix water, which is a non-sodium water, in unbelievable growth we're seeing on that. So the wa alternative waters, alternative beverages, you can see it, energy drinks, how that's changed. It applies across beverages, it applies in craft beers. We're seeing a lot of changes in craft beers. Very individual, as consumers want to be more individual in their choice and more relevant in their choice, big brands are finding it very difficult to cut through. And it's these littler brands that are driving it. And you can see all of these things are on the verge of acquisitions or they're going to plough their own furrow going forward. But there's a lot of really interesting things happening in beer, happening in vodka, happening in gin, where flavours and different trends are driving this individualistic kind of feeling of an individual uh, customer wanting things that are very much geared towards them. So interesting things happening there. Um, now, so that's real cool. Uh, lots of innovation going on. I think there's lessons from other markets to look at in ice cream. And ice cream have done some really good things to give lessons to other people. Going forward, I wanted to take a minute, I'm nearly done. I wanted to take a minute to talk a little bit about um, technology and food and some of the stuff I've been working on here. That guy on the left there, I don't know if you've, if you've never read this book. It's a guy called Norman Borlaug. It's called Our Daily Bread. Norman Borlaug was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. I think he's the only farmer that's ever been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for his work in developing, basically he was the father of the Green Revolution that allowed the world to feed itself. 
He, he went to Mexico in the 50s and 60s and changed the kind of way wheat was grown. Made the yields of wheat like 10x from where they went well before and allowed people to feed themselves. He then took it to India and Pakistan and worked across that difficult divide to create food solutions. I had the opportunity, they have a Norman Borlaug Food Prize in Iowa. Every, he's an Iowa farmer that went to Mexico and then went all the way around the world doing a lot of his work on how to use technology to change and make production of food more efficient. And um, he was fated around the world. And, you know, I went, uh, fortunate enough to go speak at a, a world, it's called the World Food Prize that Norman Borlaug's family puts on in Iowa every year. And the, the respect with which he's held around the world by China, Vietnam, all these countries that have benefited from the Green Revolution is pretty astonishing. And he's probably one of the most fantastic Americans that's unheralded. I don't know if many of you know who Norman Borlaug is, but if you don't, you should, quite frankly. He's an amazing, an amazing story when you read it. And it was kind of, kind of moving on to where I kind of think companies like Monsanto was just an extension. What Monsanto did with GMO food to create all these products that are so much more, it doesn't really come out very well, but corn and uh, papayas and tomatoes and all these products that are much, much more efficient because of GMOs with no evidence. There's been 11,000 studies around the world done. There is no negative health benefits on GMOs. None. That anyone's proven. But if you said to a consumer, do you want GMO food rather than non-GMO food? You know what they're going to say. So this kind of perception that technology which helped us feed the world is not going to help us feed the next billion people that are coming on this planet. Bothers me a little bit and marketers in the food industry have jumped onto this bandwagon and started to say no GMOs, no antibiotics. No, antibiotics is another one that I'm doing some work on. It's kind of interesting. If you take your dog to the vet and he's, the dog's not well and the vet said we're no antibiotic, we're antibiotic free, you would say w w why? The chicken industry is now in turmoil because everybody wants antibiotic free chicken. If a chicken's sick, don't you want to try and make the chicken better? There are some issues on growth hormones, there are some issues in intensification in farming, there are some issues. These are real issues for the ice cream industry. If somebody wants to do a GMO free ice cream, the costs and the implications for the dairy industry are pretty significant. But there's a real attraction for it because the customers will tell you you want it. And that's what I mean by saying I'm concerned about this perception that technology is a bad thing and that the food industry can't be trusted with our food. And there's definitely a trend towards that. And I think you've all got a role to play in trying to convince and trying to measure that dialogue because it's very easy for marketers to jump on the latest trend. Now, gluten-free is another one, really interesting. It's not really related to this, but gluten-free is another interesting one. There's more, more growing and growing evidence that people that are not, cel not got a celiac problem, if they only eat gluten-free, it's actually a problem for them. So this trend to, oh, we don't trust the food industry, leads sometimes to mistakes being made. And we should trust the nutritionalists. We should trust the people that are telling us what's good and what's bad. And... Um, I'm concerned about how that's working. Another thing, I'm, so GMO, Monsanto. Monsanto basically had to get sold because of GMOs, and they're in the middle of this big merger thing at the moment. Elanco is a company I'm working with who are doing a lot of work on trying to find better ways of keeping animals healthy in the supply chain, whether it be pigs or dairy cattle or beef cattle. How do you make them healthy without compromising some of the basic principles of, of good husbandry? which is important. And the other thing that's, I think, very relevant to the ice cream industry is, is um, sugar replacements. And there's been various products done over the years. None particularly good in my estimation in terms of the product quality. And ultimately, there is a price somewhere because people eat too much sugar in the Western world, which is leading to the diabetes problems that exist, not just in the US, but across the Western world. If we can find a sugar replacement that hasn't got other side benefits, which they're clearly side disbenefits, whether it be the taste, whether it be some of the artificial nature of some of the products that are being sold, there's a real opportunity. And I've been working with a guy in Israel called Uval Maman, 21 year old guy, was, he's now 45, when he was 21 years old. He started the first gelato business in Tel Aviv, 
Ten years later, he had 450 stores across the Middle East in Jordan and Israel and Lebanon, all sorts of places. And he got diagnosed with diabetes. He then sold his business for a billion dollars or something. And then he went for the next 10, 15 years, he's been working on a sugar replacement, which we're going to, we're going to just, we're, we're working a lot on it at the moment as how we make it work. But that principle of sugar replacement is, I think, a big prize as a primary thing for the ice cream industry. If you could get something with just as much taste, with no sugar, I promise you, that's a holy grail that would transform your, well, drive a lot of business. Um, so that's the kind of stuff in technology. I would encourage you to kind of and be as balanced as you can when you hear a lot of the dialogue in this space going forward. So, retailing. What's happening in retailing? When I started in the food industry, Kmart was the largest retailer in the world. I think it's finished now. I don't know. It's pretty close to being if it's not. It's pretty amazing how things change how things change in the industry. When you're standing in one place or at one time, and I'm sort of old enough now looking back, things never change. Things have got to move on. And so Walmart kind of took over from Kmart. Walmart's biggest worry is what Amazon are doing now and the investment they're putting in to try and tackle Amazon, taking advantage of the physical space and the the opportunity that comes from combining that physical space that they have with using the internet to place their order. That collect and go idea is how they believe they can compete with Amazon. And that's what the Amazon Whole Foods thing is all about. How can Whole Foods allow Amazon to get a bricks and mortar solution in that space? Aldi and Lidl are doing an amazing job in terms of launching in the US. They've got really good businesses, very strong businesses that I've competed with over many years and very don't underestimate them. Trader Joe's is an amazing company. Great product development, great customer loyalty and um, the discount space, the value space is going to be very relevant going forward as well. So I'm happy to take some questions on that if you want to talk about it in a bit more detail. But so I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning. You all work in a really special industry. And I want to encourage you to look forward with confidence in a fast moving world. By embracing entrepreneurship, by embracing technology, by embracing innovation, by always striving to be the best you can be, then your in industry will continue to thrive. As both a passionate observer and participant in the food industry, I've watched and seen companies and individuals. I'm inspired by those individuals that we've talked about who've changed their worlds. Whether it's Hamdi Lakaya, Dave Gold, Sam Walton, Norman Borlaug, Cole Tomai, Jerry Griffiths, Ben Cohen, or so many of your Hall of Fame inductees. They all had a passion for what they did and single-minded determination. And the outcomes of their work should be celebrated by organizations like yours. Thank you for inviting me. And I look forward to many more ice cream socials in the future. Keep making memories, guys. Thank you.